For all of human history, we have fought with the environment to produce enough food to last between growing seasons. Since food cannot be grown all year round, it is essential to preserve the food produced for human consumption for later in the year. Food preservation is such a necessity for balanced nutrition and survival that rudimentary preservation methods have existed for most of human history. Common rudimentary methods for food preservation incorporated the use of salt, dehydration, pickling, and similar methods. But food preservation changed completely in the 1800s with the introduction of canning and has continued to progress since then, integrating old methods with new technology. Modern food preservation methods focus on reducing the growth of microorganisms to extend the shelf life of food items. Consequently, foods are often exposed to various chemicals to make them an inhospitable environment for microorganisms. However, this inhospitality for microorganisms often makes people wary of the effect these foods could have on people. If these preservatives are dangerous for microorganisms, couldn't they also have a detrimental effect on human cells? Salt, a well-known food preservative and one of the oldest known preservation chemicals, is used in large quantities in many food items as an additive. Salt, or in this particular instance table salt, is combined with other food preservatives to increase the longevity of foods. Salt works in foods by changing the concentration of sodium throughout the food, attracting water through the process of osmosis. As the water leaves the cells of the foodstuff, the microorganisms, which rely on water for survival, can no longer grow and thrive. Unlike some other food preservation methods, salt is not only used to preserve food, but also to add flavor and texture, which means many foods have a very high salt content in comparison to their natural sodium levels. A molecule of table salt is composed of one atom of sodium and one atom of chlorine. When we consume salt, sodium is the atom which has an effect on the body. This relationship is why sodium content, and not salt content, is listed on nutrition labels. Whether this effect is harmful or helpful depends largely on the amount of salt we consume. But knowing how much salt to consume is difficult since the recommended daily intake of salt differs between medical institutions. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the average American consumes 3,436 milligrams of sodium daily. The CDC recommends an intake of only 1,500 milligrams daily, which means that the average American consumes more than double the recommended daily intake if CDC guidelines are followed. However, the Institute of Medicine found in recent studies that there is an associated risk with consuming less than 3,000 milligrams of sodium daily in patients who are at high risk, such as those with heart problems, even though these individuals are most often told to consume less sodium. According to the IOM, high sodium levels are not associated with increased risk in these patients until they reach 7,000 milligrams a day. Based on these results, the recommended dietary intake of sodium is set to change in 2015. If we follow the guidelines of the IOM, the average American is consuming a healthy amount of sodium. The debate on what constitutes healthy levels of sodium intake is an ongoing argument, although recent evidence seems to support the IOM's findings, suggesting that current salt intake levels are fine and that current salt levels in foods do not pose a health risk to the average person. Consequently, current research supports the idea that using salt to preserve foods is a convenient, appropriate way to help prevent microorganism growth in our rations. Nitrates and nitrites are also used for food preservation. However, while salt is widely used in a variety of ingredients, nitrates and nitrites are primarily added for the specific purpose of curing meats. Nitrates and nitrites occur naturally in the foods we eat, especially nitrates which exist in large concentrations in foods made from plants and also in water. 85% of the nitrates humans consume come from vegetables and occur naturally in varying amounts based on soil composition. Nitrites, consumed in significantly smaller quantities, are often not even ingested directly from food but are rather converted by symbiotic bacteria living in our mouths from nitrates. In fact, nitrates and nitrites are found in so many foods naturally that countries like New Zealand have ceased efforts to restrict the daily intake of these substances because regulation is virtually impossible. Like salt, nitrates and nitrites are added to meats not only as preservatives, but also to affect flavor and give meats the pink color we have come to expect. These preservatives are considered essential for meat production because they make meats inhospitable to the bacteria associated with botulism, a very serious illness which is only as rare as it is because of the inclusion of nitrates and nitrites in curing meats. Actually, nitrate consumption from cured meats only comprises 4.4% of total consumption, which means that the most of the nitrates we consume are just converted nitrates. As common as they are in our foods naturally, nitrates and nitrites seem as though they shouldn't have negative effects in the body. But evidence has been presented showing that incorporating nitrates and nitrites into meats, although very useful, can have a very detrimental effect on humans. Meats are known for having substantial levels of secondary amines, which, under the right circumstances, can react with nitrites to create nitrosamines, a known kind of carcinogen. Since some portion of nitrates will spontaneously change to nitrites over time, high levels of nitrates and nitrites in meats are linked with the production of nitrosamines. For nitrosamine production to occur, temperatures must exceed 130 degrees centigrade, and the pH value of the meat must be near 7. Consequently, restrictions on the amount of nitrates and nitrites which can be used to cure meats has been instituted by the Food and Drug Administration. 
For example, bacon, a well-loved breakfast food, is known to have higher levels of naturally occurring secondary amines than other meats. Additionally, bacon is cooked at temperatures exceeding 130 degrees centigrade, which means that the presence of nitrates and nitrites could, and does, lead to the production of nitrosamines. As a result, the FDA places even stricter regulations on the amount of these preservatives which can be added to bacon, allowing for no additional nitrates to be added and a smaller portion of nitrites than other meats to be added per slice of bacon. Nitrates and nitrites occur naturally in food and are more or less harmless by themselves, but, under the right conditions, and in the presence of secondary amines, which are found in all meats, nitrates and nitrates can lead to the production of carcinogens, and can therefore constitute a health risk when used excessively or improperly. But there are strict regulations in place to help prevent problems arising from the meat curing process. At current consumption levels and the current levels utilized for preservation, salt has no notable negative effect on the human body, according to recent studies from the IOM. However, the CDC still recommends salt intake levels lower than the average intake of an American. Nitrates and nitrites have been studied extensively, and we are well aware of the health risks associated with using these compounds in the presence of amines, and regulations have been instituted to reduce the risks associated with continued use of these compounds. We believe that food preservatives are far more useful than they are harmful. Preserving foods for later consumption allows for a global market to form and trade to occur when foods would otherwise spoil in the time it takes to transport them from one location to another. Additionally, as recent studies with salt and ongoing studies with nitrates and nitrites have shown, humans are very cautious about the additives which we place in our foods and consequently, a lot of research goes into modern preservation chemicals before they become commonplace. This research and emphasis on health means that the benefits of preserving our foods outweighs the possible health risks when we consider average consumption levels.